Gottlieb had all sorts of ideas about how he was going to use drugs. And he wanted to test drugs in all sorts of different situations. Like if they lock you inside a coffin for a week and feed you this kind of drug and that kind of drug, what's going to happen? So one of his ideas was drugs and sex. What happens if certain drugs are fed to men before or during or after they're having sex? And will they speak? That was part of the whole MK Ultra idea, to break down the barriers that make you keep secrets and not tell things. What's up, guys? Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the podcast. Before we start, this is a quick announcement to let you guys know that I'm dropping bonus episodes on Auxoro Premium. For less than $5 per month when you sign up for the year, you get a two-hour bonus episode every month of my show, The Aux, that covers exciting and sometimes twisted topics like MK Ultra, the COVID lab leak hypothesis, Tim Dillon, Tom Cruise, the Tuskegee experiment, the obesity epidemic, and more. You also get monthly solo episodes with my takes on drugs, sex, money, creativity, mindfulness, and you have the ability to submit topic suggestions for both of my shows, The Aux and The Auxoro Podcast. Expect three hours of new exclusive podcast content per month, including access to all archived episodes found nowhere else but Auxoro Premium. Visit auxoro.supercast.com to sign up today. This is the best deal in podcasting. Three hours of exclusive podcast content to punch you in the motherfucking mouth every month for less than five bucks. No half-assed episodes here. Go to auxoro.supercast.com to join the premium gang today. What's up, guys? This time I sit down with Stephen Kinzer for maybe the wildest episode to date. This this episode, as you'll see, is only an hour, but it's pretty fucking wild. They're, they're, the wildness per minute is the highest per episode that I've put out. The reason is this. Stephen Kinzer, he's written over 10 books. He's a senior fellow in international and public affairs at Brown University. And his most recent book is about Sidney Gottlieb, who most of you have probably never fucking heard of. In fact, I am sure that 99.9% of you listening to this podcast have never fucking heard of Sidney Gottlieb. But he is one of the most influential people to have existed in the 20th century. The reason is Sidney Gottlieb was the mastermind behind MK Ultra. This was an operation where the CIA was attempting to control people's minds by dosing them, many of them unknowingly, with LSD. Our own government, uh, no surprise here because <laughs> our, I, if you're like me, you know that our government is capable of some fucked up shit. But our own government, the CIA, and many doctors and scientists from around the world were working together to try to control people's minds by using LSD, mescaline, cocaine, heroin. They were, they were basically treating people like rag dolls and shooting them up with God knows what and then seeing how they react. Much of this episode and much of my research for this episode focused around the book by Stephen Kinzer called Poisoner in Chief. The full title of the book is Poisoner in Chief, Sidney Gottlieb and the CIA Search for Mind Control. This book is absolutely incredible. You actually won't believe what you're reading. A lot of people say that about books that they're trying to sell. I have no, uh, I don't gain anything financially if Stephen Kinzer sells more of these books. I'm telling you that the shit in this book, you will not fucking believe that you're re you, you won't believe you're reading it. it. Our government was running LSD experiments on prisoners, on prostitutes, on their own agents. This is an excerpt from the book Poisoner in Chief. This excerpt is from Whitey Bulger's journal. If you've seen the movie Black Mass with Johnny Depp, Johnny Depp plays Boston gangster Whitey Bulger. And Whitey Bulger, the actual Whitey Bulger, was part of these LSD experiments when he was in prison. And so this is an excerpt that's included in the book Poisoner in Chief that was written by Whitey Bulger, who was part of the MKUltra experiments. He writes, quote, the men in suits would be in a room and hook me up to machines, asking questions like, did you ever kill anyone? Would you kill someone? Two men went psychotic. They all had symptoms of schizophrenia. They had to be pried loose from under their beds, growling, barking, and frothing at the mouth. They put them in a strip cell down the hall. I never saw them or heard of them again. They told us they were helping find a cure for schizophrenia, 
When it was all over, everyone would feel suicidal and depressed, wrung out emotionally. Time would stand still. I tried to quit, but Dr. Pfeiffer would appeal to me. Please, you're my best subject. We are close to finding the cure. I was in prison for committing a crime and feel they have committed a worse crime on me. That is Whitey Bulger, Boston gangster. And that is just one excerpt from an incredible book with firsthand accounts and meticulous, meticulous research on MKUltra and Sidney Gottlieb, who is the mastermind of this whole thing. In this episode, we get into the experiences of people that were subjects in MKUltra, both willingly and unwillingly. We get into why LSD was the primary drug of choice, CIA torture houses in Germany, the specific protocols that Sidney Gottlieb would use to experiment on people with LSD. We get into why ignorance is an asset for secret agencies. And if this was going on in the CIA 50, 60 years ago, what the fuck are they doing today? So we get into all of that and more on this episode with Stephen Kinzer. Again, his book is called Poisoner in Chief. If you enjoy this episode, you will definitely want to check out his book, Poisoner in Chief, Sidney Gottlieb and the CIA Search for Mind Control. Without further ado, please enjoy this deep dive with Stephen Kinzer. <laughs> Stephen Kinzer, thank you for joining me. I appreciate it. It's good to be here. So I have to admit that for this podcast, I had an extra layer of anxiety preparing for it because I usually get the normal podcast jitters, which are, you know, I want the conversation to go well, want to ask decent questions. I hope other people enjoy it. And then because of the content, which we're going to dive into I had this extra layer of thinking about some of my past weed paranoia freak out experiences and then tying that together with what you wrote about in uh, Poisoner in Chief, which is right here. And so I was getting like flashbacks of my most kind of like felt like my mind was being ripped apart temporarily when I was too high. And I was imagining, you know, what if this happened to me? involuntarily if if someone had dosed me with a psychedelic um and i had no idea what was happening i would rather endure almost any physical torture uh than go through some of the things that were described in this book so i'll uh i'll set it up by uh admitting that and uh yeah did i, I was wondering on your end did you did you ever feel like an, an intense spike in anxiety and any experiences, whether it's psychedelics or weed or, or stories you hear that you tied back into when you were writing this book and doing the research? So this book that I wrote about the MK Ultra Project, Poisoner in Chief, is my 10th mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. uh, I've written about a lot of things that were surprising to me and those things shocked some people. But this is the first time that I've been shocked. I still can't mm. believe that a lot of this happened. And I can tell you, uh, living in a room figuratively with Sidney Gottlieb, the director of that project for a few years while working on this book, was quite a uh, difficult experience. When you're researching MK Ultra, you're only a few clicks away from the wildest conspiracies. Yeah. Uh, and then the more you get into the facts of MKUltra, the less wild some of those conspiracy ideas seem to be. So the true story of MKUltra really does drag you into areas that previously you might have thought were just the areas of fantasy and fiction. Yeah, I, I had that experience as a reader where I had heard about MKUltra and some of the surface level things that you read about in headlines. And my my thoughts were more in the realm of conspiracy. I don't know how much is of this is true. What are the facts to back it up? And then as I'm reading Poisoner in Chief, it's it seemed wild how wrong I was about my initial analysis of what happened in MK Ultra, and then to have the facts and experiences, even with most of what happened with MK Ultra ultimately being destroyed, 
still what's left to discover and, and what's left in people's accounts and what actually happened is it, it's crazy. It's crazy. And you're right. So I've tried, as I do in all my books, to confine myself strictly to verifiable facts. The chapter I'm the proudest of in all of my books, it's the footnotes. Everything there, it's from somewhere. It's not speculation. Uh, that So that said, even though I have put together what's, I guess, the main book about MK Ultra, I'm painfully aware that, as you suggested, I've only scratched the surface of what MK Ultra was mm. and what Sidney Gottlieb did. Most of it was destroyed. And the reason those two guys, Gottlieb and his superior Richard Helms, decided to do that was not because, as they later testified, there was a paperwork uh, uh, overflow at the CIA or that mm. they wanted to protect reputations. It was obviously that they didn't want to be held to account for what they had done. They mm. calculated that any penalty they might pay for destroying federal property would be nothing compared to what might happen if those files were one day seen in public. And that was a correct calculation. So, uh, mm -hmm. so much is unknown. And, and, and putting together not just the story of uh, MK Ultra, but the story of its director, Sidney Gottlieb, was especially difficult because the whole project and Gottlieb were shrouded in such intense secrecy. Nobody knew what was going on inside MK Ultra, even at the CIA. The highest people had only a vague idea, which is the way they wanted it. They wanted mm. Gottlieb to go out and do this on his own with the theory that later on, if things were exposed as later they were, they could blame it all on us, one unsupervised individual. So, uh, the fact that we, ha that these this guy and this project were shrouded in such secrecy meant that essentially in Poisoner in Chief, I'm writing the biography of a person who wasn't there. He lived in absolute invisibility. And I've had to try to piece together the little threads and uh, try to produce a, a portrait of a guy who you, uh, having read the book, will recognize as really an extraordinary and bizarre character. I put him down as the most powerful unknown American of the 20th century, unless there yeah, was I... someone else that we don't know about who also operated an international network of centers in which he conducted the most extreme and intense experiments on human beings ever conducted by any official of the U.S. government and had what amounted to a license to kill issued by mm -hmm. the U.S. government. Yeah, that, that's a, a perfect transition. And, and you must be reading my notes or controlling my mind in some way, because I had that at the top to uh, to dive into that you wrote, I discovered the most powerful unknown man of the 20th century. And I wanted to know, can, can you tell the story of how you came across Sidney Gottlieb and, and how the hooks started to sink in even before you knew the severity of what had happened and what he had done along with the CIA, what were the initial hooks that kind of drew you into the story and drew you into Sidney Gottlieb? In the in one of my past books, which is a book about uh, Secretary of State John Foster Dulles and his brother Alan Dulles, the head of the CIA, who served under President Eisenhower in the 1950s, I mentioned plots against foreign leaders, that is, Poison plots, plots to kill foreign leaders. Mm -hmm. And there was one uh, episode that stuck in my mind. I mentioned it in my book about the Dulles brothers, uh, the, the brothers, but uh, I didn't really go into it in all of its details. In that story, it says that the CIA sent poison to the Congo in 1960 to kill the prime minister of the Congo, Patrice Lumumba. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I began wondering, so when you say they sent poison, somebody carried it, would that have been a courier or what was the details? Well, it turns out it was not a courier. The person who brought that poison, who has to go down as the only person in American history ever to carry a vial of poison across an ocean fabricated by the U.S. government aimed to kill the leader 
of another country uh, was Sidney Gottlieb. He was then the chief of the chemical division of uh, the CIA. So I began to realize uh, that he had testified, he had been identified in the 1970s as the person who made the poison pills to kill Castro and all the other poison uh, mm -hmm. the suicide pills that were given to spies in case they had to kill themselves. Anything that had to do with poison, that was Gottlieb. That's why I call my book Poisoner in Chief. So this came out uh, in the uh, hearings in the 1970s that Gottlieb had been involved in this. And that was essentially uh, all that leaked into the public domain uh, through the press. So I began to look into Gottlieb and I realized that actually... What he did in making poisons to kill foreign leaders was not the most important part of his job. That actually was minor. That's just the job for a pharmacist. If, if it weren't Gottlieb, somebody else could make poison yeah, pills. Yeah, you would but think I, uh, if you were making a resume and, and someone told you, yeah, I created poisons to assassinate foreign leaders, you would say, oh, that's that's the headline. Like That's the, that, that's the draw into your, your resume of poisoning people or medical torture and then you're like wait but i also did this which is mk ultra and so so it's kind of it's funny how you discovered this thing that is you know the the poisoning is very violent and calculated and has many horrific parts to it on its own and that led to something even more torturous and horrific which was mk ultra yeah, I began to realize something that the senators didn't grasp or and to some degree wanted to stay away from. And that was that MK Ultra was something that revolved entirely around Gottlieb. Had he not been there, it might have been a very different project. And while he was there, uh, it was astonishingly intense and international. But uh, none of this came out during the Senate hearings. And he became known, if at all, as uh, the guy who made the poisons. And then for one little aspect of MK Ultra, which was uh, his interest in LSD. But uh, mm -hmm. I began to realize that MK Ultra was the f widest ranging attempt in world history to try to penetrate the human mind and turn it to the use of intelligence agencies. The goal of MK Ultra was to find a way to seize control of the human mind. And Gottlieb, with a scientist's approach, decided that the first thing you have to do in order to figure out how to implant a new mind into somebody's brain would be to find a way to destroy the mind that was already in there. He devoted intense experiments over many years to doing just this, to finding the key to destroying a human mind and a human body and a human spirit. And who did he turn to as his first reference points? Also like a good scientist, he asked himself, so what research is already out there? Who already knows about destroying minds and bodies? Oh, he noticed there were the Nazi doctors from the concentration camps. Why don't we just hire some of them and catch up on what they know about poisons and killing people and, and what works to destroy psyches? So that was the basis on which Gottlieb uh, built this incredible MK Ultra program, which, uh, as I said, I've still not managed to wrap my own mind around mm -hmm. despite immersing myself in it for years. Yeah. And, and uh, b before we dive into some of the, the specifics of exactly what was going on in these experiments with LSD, uh, there's also mescaline, a, a, a bunch of other drugs. Could you give a, a brief overview of the progression of Gottlieb's protocols and, and how he got from or how he went from I'm going to try this out I'm going to dose people with LSD I'm going to dose people and try to shatter their minds and rebuild it how did he get from that first trial essentially to building this strict protocol that eventually 
was it had global hooks. He was instructing other doctors and scientists on how to do this across the country and across the world. What's up, guys? This is a quick break in the episode to remind you that if you like this conversation, you'll love Auxoro Premium. Go to auxoro.supercast.com to gain access to bonus episodes, the ability to suggest topics, and all premium archives for less than $5 per month. This is the best deal in premium podcasting, motherfucker. Go to auxoro.supercast.com for three hours of exclusive podcast content per month. We are allergic to half-assed episodes. Go to auxoro.supercast.com today. Gottlieb organized MK Ultra very methodically. Um, he recognized that uh, the CIA itself did not have resources to conduct these kinds of experiments. It doesn't have clinics or hospitals. It cannot requisition patients. Uh, so, uh, so he set out to create essentially two networks, one inside the United States and one outside. So the network inside the United States uh, was based on contracting doctors at prison hospitals uh, and other medical institutions, including psychiatric hospitals. Mm -hmm. um, he contracted with some doctors, for example, who treated psychiatric patients for relatively minor uh, afflictions like depression or postpartum problems. And once those patients were in the grip of these uh, psychiatrists or psychologists who were working for MK Ultra, they would become guinea pigs for these horrific experiments. Others, uh, I mentioned, uh, were taking place in prisons. For example, um, Godley wanted to know if uh, heavy doses of LSD would ultimately destroy a human mind. So we have a protocol, one of the few that gets rescued by indirect means from the MK Ultra uh, record destruction, uh, that tells us about an experiment that happened at the federal prison in Lexington, Kentucky. So seven African American inmates were segregated and given what were described as triple and quadruple doses of LSD every day for 77 days Jesus. without being told what was happening to them. So these were really horrific, and I've often wondered about that one. I, I'm sure those poor guys, if they lived at all, never knew what happened to them. They probably died without having an inkling that they were subjects of a diabolical experiment directed by an official of the U.S. government. So these kinds of experiments were going on in many parts of the United States and even in Canada. Then Gottlieb expanded his network and began working in secret prisons, essentially, or detention centers mm. in other countries, particularly in Germany, in the Philippines, and other parts of East Asia. While I was researching this book, I discovered what I think might be the first CIA secret prison. It's in a lovely chalet at the end of a lane, and not so far from Frankfurt. Uh, and the guy who now owns it, who's an entrepreneur who's made it into a few lovely condos, mm -hmm. um, took me down into the basement. And he said, these are the cells where the CIA doctors carried out those experiments that were actually only extensions of the experiments that the Nazi doctors were conducting only a few years earlier, right down the road. So it's an old he, CIA torture house, essentially. This is, this is where they used matter, to conduct the experiments. Der Spiegel, the German news magazine, described it exactly this way. They had an article about this house, and they said this was the CIA torture house. And this entrepreneur who's now bought the house told me, that the people in the neighborhood are fully aware of what went on there and have told him that the bodies of people who were experimented to death in that basement were buried in forests nearby in places that mm -hmm. are now covered over by shopping malls and apartment blocks. Yeah. You, you've looked at this man more than... May, it, it, I would be willing to bet that you know more about Sidney Gottlieb than possibly anyone to ever exist. Maybe even his own 
family, I'm sure, did not know a lot of the most of the things that he was doing. You, you describe him as the invisible man, essentially, which he is. And I'm curious, you you mentioned the LSD experiments where he was giving triple doses to inmates for 77 days straight. And Gottlieb had a lot of characteristics about him that you point to in the book that are nuanced, where he's a warm-hearted torturer or gentle-hearted torturer, where he had this mindful, almost hippie-like thinking about him, where he clearly cared about some things like nature and treating some people well, and then he was also able to separate that and watch people be psychologically tortured in his presence. And I'm thinking while I'm reading this, when I have been to festivals or maybe other parties and someone has clearly had too much to smoke or maybe they're taking mushrooms or something or maybe they're just anxious and freaking out, I immediately place myself, you know, in, in how horrific it must be to be that person right now. And if I can, I'll try to say something or do something to distract that person's mind from it because other people have done the same to me. And I, I'm wondering, what's your take on how he was able to com compartmentalize those two aspects of his, uh, the, the two aspects of the ways that he walked through the world, which is I'm going to care about the well-being of these people. I'm going to be mindful. I'm going to develop empathy in these aspects of my life. And then it seems like he's able to turn it, flip a switch and then see the, uh, you used a word in the book. I'm, I'm forgetting what it was, but to describe the experimentees, the the, the expendables. H how is he able to compartmentalize the expendables from the people that he cared about? Because it seems like something that's you, you have to develop that. Like you're, it, it would be hard to imagine that you're just born with that. This is one of the most fascinating aspects about this strange figure of Sidney Gottlieb, who, as I said, was totally unknown until I, I published this book. I can tell you just as a preface that um, in the town where I live, where I grew up, um, a guy among the people that have retired there have houses in the summer is a former director of the CIA. And I ran into him in his short pants getting his coffee one morning. And I mentioned to him, I'm writing a book about a, a figure from the old CIA from the 50s. And he said, who is it? And I said, Sidney Gottlieb. And he said, I never heard of him. And I believe him. Even, even a former director of the CIA, he wasn't director at the time when Gottlieb was working there. But nobody knew about Gottlieb. Even this guy who was a former director of the CIA. So who was this really strange person? We've already described him as this diabolical figure who didn't mind torturing people to death in this kind of mad scientist quest for uh, a, a, a secret that he later admitted didn't exist, mind control. At the end of it all, he said, well, I guess it's true, uh, what, I, what I didn't want to face before, that that mind control actually just got made up by people that were writing novels and fiction, and I got too carried away. So sorry I had to destroy all those lives. That's the one Gottlieb, the one who seems so cold-hearted, uh, and that he would conduct such heinous experiments and not be concerned about their human consequences. Then, at the same time, Gottlieb was a really compassionate, feeling human being. This was a guy who was really, as you put it, a crypto-hippie in an early time. Mm -hmm. This was in the 50s. I don't think any other federal employee lived like him. He didn't live in a development you know, outside of Washington, D.C. He lived in a cabin out in the woods and it didn't have running water. He got up before dawn to milk his goats. Uh, he grew his own vegetables. Um, he studied Buddhism. He wrote poetry. Um, he was a deeply spiritual person. He used LSD himself uh, by his own admission 200 times at least. Uh, so then comes this question. How do you reconcile this? Do you flip mm -hmm. a switch, as you put it? Well, when you're going over a bridge, then you're leaving Washington, D.C., you leave the old uh, torturer persona behind, and you become the, the loving uh, uh, guy at home uh, taking care of the goats. Um, I, I don't know, because uh, 
when I was writing this book, uh, one thing I wanted to do was to try to get in touch with Gottlieb's children, who now are adults. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I worked on this project. I, I focused on the older son, and, and I knew who he was and where he was, and I tried to contact him through this, you know, email and Facebook and letters and registered everything, and I didn't get anything back. And um, I was about to go out and doorstop him and just go out there to uh, Wisconsin and just plunk myself there and grab him. And, uh, but then, fortunately, saving me the trip, uh, I found a person close to the family who told me, don't bother, because when Sidney Gottlieb died... His widow called the children together and made them promise that they would never speak about their father. Mm-hmm. So that's the reason I was told that uh, you didn't get any response when you tried to reach them. So the kids, now I say, well, older adults, might have some idea in their head as to how Gottlieb put these two pieces of his uh, psyche together. I don't know. But I, I came up with one possible thought mm-hmm. so we have to put godly back in the in the uh, times in which he lived that was the or in, at least in the times in which he was running mk ultra specifically the 1950s in the early 1950s americans were caught up in an intense cold war fever we mm-hmm. thought the soviets were ready to launch a devastating apocalypse at any moment and that this apocalypse would not only destroy america but that it would destroy any possibility for meaningful human life on Earth forever. And on the good side, the best we could hope for is that we would survive physically, but we'd be enslaved to demonic masters. It was a, it was a very intense period. And the Cold War narrative might have been the most powerfully developed political narrative in modern history. Uh, so Gottlieb was a part of this. Uh, and... Uh, he might, uh, again, now I'm speculating, just having lived in my yeah, little room, yeah, of this room where I'm sitting now uh, with Sidney Gottlieb while I was writing this book. I speculate possibly on this one. Maybe he was thinking to himself, I don't live a conventional life. I decided to make my life different from other people. That's why I live out in the woods and milk my goats and eat organic food in 1953. Um, now, there's a evil force out there in the world that is intent on making it impossible for anyone to live an independent individual life. It's a system that is going to force everyone into being an automaton and a slave. A person like me would never be able to exist under that system, and the threat of that system taking over the world is real and imminent. Therefore, In the face of such an overwhelming threat, isn't it regretfully necessary to put aside what might otherwise be known as morality or legality or ethics or scruples and look to the greater good and realize that although it's unpleasant, these are things that we have Mm -hmm. to do, which is actually a phrase that Gottlieb used during one of his testimonies. He said, I want this committee to know I found this work very difficult and very unpleasant, but very necessary. And that's uh, how I, from there, I extrapolate this possibility. Yeah, and what's great about the book is that if you stop and think while you're reading it, which I, I, I tried to go back to what is this driving force that is compelling Gottlieb to, to keep doing this. And it, I'll caveat this by saying that I've only, I, I've, I've read the book, I've listened to your lecture, but I am, I'm in no way an authority obviously on what has happened to, or what uh, Sidney Gottlieb did. But when I, when I kept thinking about it, when I kept thinking about the, the force that was driving him, the patriotism kept popping up in my head and I kept going back to, you know, this guy, he, maybe he was much more patriotic than the vibe he was giving off. A lot of times we think we, we tie in patriotism, especially today to conservatism. And you don't necessarily, you don't necessarily think of today's uh, patriots as like the more liberal types of people, but he, he was denied from the military. He couldn't 
he couldn't act. He couldn't serve in our United States military. He saw himself, and I'm speculating right now too, he, he saw himself as this ultimate patriot and he was looking at everything through the lens of patriotism. And the thing that popped up in my head towards the end of the book was maybe Gottlieb saw himself as the poison that America needed. I'm putting my tinfoil hat on now. Like Gottlieb actually saw himself as the poison America needed. And the definition of poison from the, the Royal Society of Chemistry is that poisons can be used and be of benefit to society when used appropriately. And then they give an example. Um, warfarin is used in high doses as rat poison, but low doses are clinically low doses are used clinically to prevent blood clots after a stroke or a heart attack. And so I'm, I'm thinking maybe Gottlieb saw himself as a poison where if there were too many of him, if there were hundreds or thousands of Gottliebs, that would poison America. Like that would poison the body of America. It would be a fatal blow. But in low doses of what he was doing, and, and there was only one of him that we know of, one person that was the head of this um, entire operation, if there was just one, one person that was doing what he was doing, which is, is medical torture and, and trying to find a way to control people's minds, that low dose would prevent these fatal blood clots that were happening to America, which was, you know, maybe communism in his mind or preventing double agents. And so I'm, I'm thinking like maybe he he was a shit scientist the the way that I'm reading it but he was great at creating poisons and so maybe he just identified with that aspect of what he was good at and thought in his mind I'm necessary for society not everyone can be like me nor they should but I'm here for a reason and so he rationalized in his own head that you know what I'm doing as long as it's not taken to the extreme where where hundreds of or thousands of people are running similar operations like the country can take one mk ultra and that will make us stronger you're right in describing the various forces that led to uh, godlieb's patriotism and and i would just add one more don't forget that unlike most of the other uh figures in the early CIA, Gottlieb was not the product of the U.S. Uh, aristocracy. He didn't mm -hmm. go to a prep school in New England and, and then go to work for a bank or, or an investment firm. Uh, he was the children of Jewish immigrants in the Bronx. The father was in the clothing business uh, so uh, and, and had immigrated from Central Europe. This actually is one of the strangest aspects of the mm -hmm. Gottlieb story because had the, had his parents not emigrated and had he uh, stayed back in Central Europe, he might well have been arrested by the Nazis and possibly even made the victim of one of these heinous uh, medical experiments. But as it turned out, he didn't seem to have any problem working shoulder to shoulder with the doctors who had carried out those experiments in the Nazi camps. So he was an immigrant, and I think that also gave him a sense of uh, desire to serve his country. Um, he did, I think, uh, perhaps come to feel that uh, what he had done was regrettable. Later in life, people who knew him long after he retired, shortly before he died, were saying that he seemed to be carrying a heavy burden. Well, one person told me he seemed to be racked with guilt. Um, but maybe, as you suggest, he felt that taking the moral burden of having to do these terrible things onto himself was another piece of the job that somebody had to do. And as I suggested earlier, I think the uh, people at the top of the CIA were very happy to let a guy like him do it. They understood that what Gottlieb was going to do was going to be awful, that it was going to be bloody, and that he was going to kill people. But they didn't want to know the details. He was left almost completely unsupervised. And one reason for this was so that CIA officials could later say, oh, he did all that, but he was unsupervised. So it was intentional in the culture of the CIA and of other secret services. Ignorance is, is often an asset. You don't want to know a lot of things. So Gottlieb was kind of left out there on his own. And you could argue that he felt that this was something that somebody had to do. On the other hand, if you had some sadistic tendencies, this would certainly be the kind of job you'd want to get into and cloak it with some other patriotic motives. Uh, 
I can tell you uh, one little other observation that happened to me soon after I published Poisoner in Chief. Mm -hmm. I was making some uh, book uh, presentations, and actually I made one where I teach at Brown University, and one of my colleagues raised her hand after the speech to ask a question, and she said, I want to, um, I want to contradict or question one of the comments that you made. She, uh, you, he said, she said, you said Sidney Gottlieb actually never was able to brainwash anyone. And in the end, he came up with the realization that brainwashing is just a myth. Mm -hmm. But she said, I think you were wrong because he did manage to brainwash one person. And that was himself. He brainwashed himself into believing this because he wanted to believe that this was out there and that he was doing something that was for the good of humanity. And herein, I think, lies one of the long-term lessons that jumps right out at you from Gottlieb's moral calculation. Uh, it, it all We often hear that we have to make uh, momentary departures from our standards and civil rights and, and laws because of this urgent emergency situation. But the emergency situation often never seems to end. And there always seems to be another excuse. And I think Gottlieb, if he could come back and speak to us, would, would speak a lot about the era. And he said it was, a, he would say it's a special, I'm so intense. If you weren't there, you couldn't understand the pressures and the imminence that we feared of an imminent attack. Uh, but yet now we're always, it's always the terrorists or there's some kind of other threat. It's very dangerous to begin thinking that uh, you got to sacrifice morality for a great cause, particularly because one of the most persuasive causes is patriotism. That one is always dredged up to persuade people mm -hmm. to do things that they wouldn't normally do because their conscience uh, is against it. And that danger, I think, is one of the lessons you can draw from the story of Sidney Gottlieb and MK Ultra. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great point by your student. A uh, great observation where, um, you know, Sidney Sidney Gottlieb succeeded in controlling one person's mind, and that's himself. It, and it's crazy how much we can control and, and influence our minds, and and how much crossover there can be between the aftermath of an involuntary psychedelic experience and also the aftermath of distorting your own reality and convincing yourself of this is the way things are and I'm going to create these rationalizations and you're going unchecked. Maybe you're in a position of power like Gottlieb where you, no one's really questioning you. You are letting your imagination run wild and you're creating different schemes and different plots which you want to fulfill, but then no one's pushing back against that reality. So when no one pushes back against it or, and you're not actively trying to learn and better yourself and be a good person, a kind person, what can fill in the gaps, it seems like, is your own rationalizations. And rather than changing your attitude or behavior, you can come up with ways and, and be super creative because that, that's the other thing that I was, uh, that would constantly cross my mind is he was very, he had a, a creative way in which he conducted his medical torture. He was, he was messing with the the order and what types of drugs and the, even the way that he described it which is you want to completely shatter the brain and then build it back up into something that you can control there's a very visual and flow of someone kind of drawing things out and, and imagining what the outcome will be and, and so if you if you're being hyper creative and you're and you're putting all these ideas out and you have thousands of dollars at your disposal from the CIA and you can basically orchestrate things without anyone checking in on you. I, I can understand like the, the rationalization aspect of that, which is it, your own thoughts start to kick in and, and push you towards the thing that you want so badly, even past the point of performing good science because as you mentioned in the book his uh he basically realized that mind control was not going to be a thing 18 months i believe it was or less than 18 months when he was doing experiments with lsd he thought that this you know this is not going to work out and then he kept doing it and, and 
to me, it, it seems like, you know, no, if no one's checking you, you have the budget, you have the tools, you can basically tell anyone to do what they want. Your own brain kind of becomes this very malleable, uh, this very malleable uh, like thing, your, your own ideas become this malleable thing that's subject to the pressure of your, how, how far you can go to rationalize your own behavior and your own actions. You mentioned the phrase uh, that he let his imagination run wild. That, that's really true. Um, and this, I think, is the thing that uh, the senators who finally got to talk to Gandhi m totally missed. Because, as I said at the beginning, formulating a pill that can be dropped in somebody's drink and kill them it does not require a diabolically creative imagination. You could probably figure out how to do mm. that from reading a chemistry book. But MK Ultra was not like that. And you were right to say that uh, Gottlieb was a very creative person. He was creative in a diabolical way. But uh, the way that he shaped these exper experiments uh, shows that... Uh, he was trying to imagine how he could find a secret hidden inside the human brain that people have been trying to unlock for many centuries. He saw himself as a kind of a wizard. Uh, and uh, I think this creativity uh, also did uh, feed into and in turn was fed back by his own LSD use. Um, while I was imagining, as you, the, the phenomena you pointed out, that these experiments are so bizarre in their diabolical creativity, I asked myself, mm. could he have come up with some of the ideas for these tortures while he was tripping on acid? This, to me, was really mm. jarring. And then, after Poisoner in Chief was published and I was being interviewed, in fact, it was by Terry Gross on uh, NPR, she asked me something that I hadn't even thought of, which is even worse. And that is, don't, could he have been taking LSD while he was watching the experiments in the basement of that mm -hmm. villa in Germany or someplace like that? This is almost too much to contemplate. Yeah, I mean, if he, if he did have even an ounce of empathy for the people he was experimenting on. It makes sense that he would need to alter his brain in some way to be able to go through it. Maybe it started to bother him. So he, he did take drugs while he was performing these experiments. So he didn't have to fully be hit with how he was completely shattering these people's minds, but it's, um, uh, it, yeah, it's it, it, it's wild to think about. Was was he actually taking LSD during these experiments, and was he doing that to block out the pain of what he was causing, or was he doing it to induce more creativity? Like, let me let me see what I can come up with when I watch these experiments tripping out. Kind of like a music artist would take LSD and then just play around on the piano or drink a little bit and kind of induce another slice of reality besides sobriety and it's like the, the it, it's hard to I, I credit is the wrong word but but it's like hard to talk about some of the someone who does horrible things to people and then also talk about things that are part of what they did that are normally praised like creativity or imagination or coming up with these complex protocols, it, it, it makes me feel very uneasy talking about it. And I can only imagine some of the things that you felt while you're, while you're writing the book, some of that like complex nuance of human emotion where you have a guy that has so many different parts of him, some of which are impressive, some of which are diabolical, some of which are neutral. That's what makes for an interesting figure. I mean, think of all the interesting people we've read about in novel, who are central figures in novels. Uh, complexity and, and uh, is always fascinating. Uh, but I tell you, it's quite a challenge to piece together a life lived so secretly. Um, I can tell you uh, that while I was uh, working on Poisoner in Chief, I was also in touch with the CIA to try to get various documents 
most of which I didn't get, but some of which they did provide. Um, and at one point, I was very excited uh, to learn that the CIA was going to give me a photograph of Gottlieb that had been taken while he was working at the CIA. Nobody had ever seen one of these before. So they sent me the photos. I was very uh, thrilled, and I told my editor, okay, we've got this great, we have a photo of him now. We're going to put this on the cover. And he was also very excited. Then he sent me an email about it two hours later, and he said, well, I just talked this over with people here. They hate the idea because they say, nobody's going to recognize him. Nobody knows who he is. So instead, the book comes out with a, just a black silhouette. And I think actually that does reflect uh, who he was. Trying to penetrate his psyche um, was a, a very difficult thing to do. And uh, match trying to match uh, what seemed like his eagerness to inflict uh, incalculable amounts of pain on innocent people uh, with this uh, sort of compassionate nature was a real challenge. Yeah. I wanted to read an excerpt from the book, which comes from Whitey Bulger's journal entry about the experiments that were being performed on him in prison. And Whitey Bulger, uh, for those of you listening, he is a, a Boston gangster. He had the movie Black Mass made about him where Johnny Depp played Whitey Bulger. And so this is a, an entry from Whitey Bulger's diary, who is one of the experimentees, one of the expendables. And he wrote, the men in suits would be in a room and hook me up to machines, asking questions like, did you ever kill anyone? Would you kill someone? Two men went psychotic. They all had the symptoms of schizophrenia. They had to be pried loose from under the beds, growling, barking, and frothing at the mouth. They put them in a strip cell down the hall. I never saw or heard of them again. They told us they were helping find a cure for schizophrenia. When it was all over, everyone would feel suicidal and depressed, wrung out emotionally, time would stand still, and I tried to quit. But Dr. Pfeiffer would appeal to me, saying, please, you're my best subject, and we are close to finding a cure. And, and Dr. Pfeiffer was one of the people uh, that Gottlieb was in contact with, who was helping to run the experiments. And, and I thought two things when I read that. I, I thought, um, how horrific that, how horrific it must have been to having been dosed like that. Um, and Whitey Bulger, the last part of the quote was, I was in prison for committing a crime and feel like they have committed a worse crime on me. So I was thinking, how bad must it have been to be part of this experiment that a guy like Whitey Bulger? who has orchestrated the murders of dozens, possibly hundreds of people, have been involved deep in the mafia, um, has done a lot of terrible things himself. He's no scrub next to Sidney Gottlieb, but he was like, damn, like this is horrible. Like th this, this, to him, this was something that he sounds like he had a hard time understanding how terrible of a crime this would be. And, and then the other thing that popped into my head was how responsible is Sidney Gottlieb for the actions of his experimentees after they get out of the experiment, after these prisoners leave and, and they go back into society, if they, the, the ones that don't kill themselves are actually able to function like Whitey Bulger clearly was, how responsible would Sidney Gottlieb be for the aftermath of what he did to these prisoners, which is the action of the prisoners and the actions of the other experimentees that didn't necessarily know what was being done to them, but maybe they went on to commit other heinous acts like killing people or just being terrible people in general. How he's responsible for the medical experiments, but then also it's like, is he also responsible for what Whitey Bulger did after he left prison? Is he responsible for the acts that people did after he basically destroyed their minds? And that was something that I was trying to grapple with too. It's like, it's accountability inception where he did this medical torture. And then for those people that were able to function after that, they're now walking through the world with 
a clear lens. They're walking through the world with someone who just blasted their mind away with LSD. Whitey Bulger uh, had never killed anybody by the time those experiments were carried out on him. He did go on to kill a lot of people, but he was just in jail as a truck hijacker. He was a sort of middle-level Boston thug when the time that happened. Um, and it wasn't until the 1970s, so 20 years later, after Bulger had had this terrible experience mm -hmm. in prison, uh, that he uh, saw news about MK Ultra, the first uh, r reports of it in the press, and he immediately figured out this must have been what happened to me. He was right. He didn't know it at the time, but Dr. Pfeiffer, who he mentions, was a, a subcontractor, and in that torture that uh, Whitey Bulger underwent was was part of an MK Ultra experiment. Uh, and he told his friends after find, figuring this out, I'm going to go down to Atlanta, and I'm going to find that Pfeiffer, and I'm going to kill him. Now, he never did that, as far as we know. Uh, but it does make you wonder, what about all the others? We One of the reasons I put the Whitey Bulger story in my book is that there are so few accounts by people who actually know that this is what happened to them and that it can be verified. Like those seven guys in the Lexington, Kentucky prison, they never wrote anything. They're not accessible to anybody. We wouldn't be able to find them. And the other people in the prison are all uh, documented on protocols that were destroyed when Gottlieb, uh, when Gottlieb left. Uh, so uh, you mentioned accountability. Uh, there really is no accountability. And I can tell you that after I published this book, I got, I got, it's still happening. I get emails from people who say, I think I was, or my father was, or somebody was the victim of an MK Ultra experiment. And uh, how can I, how can I find out? And the answer is you can't. It's, it's very painful. Uh, I'm sure at least some of the people that have sent me inquiries were. I don't know which ones. I can't help them. But uh, you're, you're right. It's, it's quite something to think about uh, the years, the numbers of people who were sort of staggering through the rest of their lives, maybe without even knowing that they had been the victim of some terrible experiment. And uh, one of Gottlieb's henchmen later testified, you never went back to them afterwards. You don't go see, like, see how they're mm -hmm. doing. That's, that's a taboo. Yeah. So they're just left on their own. And uh, that's one reason why working for a government agency is great cover for any kind of sociopath. Yeah, yeah. And, and one of those aspects of MKUltra where people were taken in and then dosed and released back into the world with no follow-up was Operation Midnight Climax, which the uh, the... <laughs> The, the juice is in the, the name of the title. And, and so I, I wanted to ask you, and for listeners as well, uh, what was Operation Midnight Climax and, and how did that all come together? Godley had all sorts of ideas about how he was going to use drugs. And he wanted to test drugs in all sorts of different situations. Like if they lock you inside a coffin for a week and feed you this kind of drug and that kind of drug, what's going to happen? Uh, so one of his ideas was drugs and sex. What happens if certain drugs are fed to men before or during or after they're having sex? And will they speak? That was part of the whole MK Ultra idea to get break to break down prisoners, to break down the barriers that make you keep secrets and not tell things. So could there be some combination of sex and drugs uh, that would unlock this uh, mystery? To do this, Gottlieb set out, set up a bordello in uh, San Francisco, up on Telegraph Hill. He had an apartment with uh, mirrors and all the accoutrements, uh, like you know, Toulouse Lautrec prints on the wall. And then he had a couple of guys working for him. They uh, hired the girls, and the girls' job was to bring their clients back to this apartment. There they would, the clients would then be fed some kind of drug, whatever it was that Gottlieb was interested in trying that month. And then there would be somebody, usually somebody who was not a scientist, doesn't have the slightest idea about psychology or anything like that, probably some drug cop, sitting behind a uh, one-way mirror, 
on a portable toilet drinking cocktails out of a pitcher and making notes about what he's seeing. So Godley was our, was operating as what amounted to a national security whorehouse in San Francisco and using tax dollars to pay prostitutes in an effort to stop communism from taking over the United States or giving America a tool to win the Cold War. Uh, now, uh, in the course of writing this book and re researching the different strands that went into Gottlieb, uh, I naturally tried to follow everything I could about this Operation Midnight Climax, as the Bordello operation in San Francisco was colloquially called. Um, and I found uh, one interesting piece of testimony. It was buried in a giant cache of documents that the what a lawyer had accumulated who was following a case against Gottlieb for more than 20 years. So I found this one a piece of testimony um, from a guy who had been one of the people that ran the Operation Midnight Climax Bordello. And he said... I'm going to clean it up a little. Godley yeah. was really interested in sex. And every time he came to San Francisco to come and look at our project, he wanted me to set him up with girls. It was, it was the first thing he wanted as soon as he got here. So later on, I began to wonder. This was a nice perk of the job for him. But it's even by MK Ultra standards, it is a kind of a stretch to think that you're going to find the secret of mind control by hiring hookers to bring people in and drink funny mm -hmm. drinks before they have sex. So could it have possibly been just part of Gottlieb's original motivation? Here I am, a guy in my middle age, and I'm married with my family, and boy, I've got the I've got the CIA budget. Why don't I set myself up with some business that I have in San Francisco that I have to go and visit and monitor regularly? Yeah. So possibly that uh, quintessentially testosterone-driven middle-aged man uh, motivation could have fed into one of the most bizarre of all the MK Ultra projects. Yeah, it's like the uh, the Secret Service version of a midlife crisis, and it's like you have access to all this money and, and resources and, and you call your buddies and you're like, hey, what if we just set up safe houses across the country and gave people drugs and, and watch them have sex and, and see what happens? And, and your friends are like, yeah, like, fuck it, let's yeah, do it. And, and then we can take advantage. We, we have all these girls working for us. And that's the other thing the guy said in his uh, in his uh, deposition. He said, and all those girls, they never charged godly. They always did it as a favor to me. So it was nice. It's nice to have a job where you can get that done, especially when yeah, you're working like, for the U.S. government. Yeah, it's like I'm, I'm trying to imagine if there was ever a guy that realized he was being watched during sex where maybe someone dropped a pitcher of margaritas in the bathroom or something or there was a wire hanging out from the wall and he, he put it all together and like how – even if someone told me you are you were watched last night when you were having sex with this woman, and by the way, that wasn't just a, an anxiety attack or, or a panic attack. Like you were actually given mescaline or, or LSD or whatever he was giving people at the time. I would not believe it. I, I, I don't even think I would entertain that thought if someone was showing me, you know, Unless someone showed me pictures or videos, like that's one of those things where he must have thought of it. And thirty, you know, thirty seconds later, he's like, "Even if we get caught doing this, like, who's going to believe that we were watching people you're do one way right. mirrors?" <laughs> you're you're right. Uh, first of all, it's so the truth is so far fetched that uh, nobody would believe it, including the people who were the victims, as you suggest. Yeah. But also. Uh, the fact is that those people, many of them would have left in a terrible condition, uh, never understanding. Probably this was something that, that had never happened to them before. They couldn't place it at all. They would have been totally shocked. Uh, but don't forget, they, all, they also could not complain. This is the great beauty of it having been a bordello, that you can't go to the police. You can't tell your wife or your doctor. So actually, it's a great cover. I'm, I'm wondering, was there was there ever a point in your research where you had to stop yourself from empathizing with some aspect of Sidney Gottlieb, whether it was creativity 
or he he also did a bunch of good things at the end of his life where he was I believe he was running a clinic for people with leprosy in India and he created organizations foundations known as this good guy was there ever a point in your research specifically where you had to snap yourself out of this kind of empathy where maybe you wouldn't want to write bad things about the guy but then you remember like oh he also did all of this was there any part of him that you found yourself going back to and being like but he also you know he he did this good thing and and then you snap yourself out of it and you're like I, I need to I, I need to be unbiased and brutal where it calls for it you're putting your finger on a very real syndrome that biographers have to deal with. You're very close to the person you're writing about, inevitably. That's what the job requires. And so uh, you, you do develop a sort of a relationship and at some level an innate sympathy and uh, for an, an understanding of that person. So I, there was uh, one little episode, though, that uh, reflects uh, what you're referring to. Uh in the very end of the book, I realized I had to make some conclusions of my own about Gottlieb. And of course, by this time, at the point of writing the end of the book, I've spent all this time already with him. And I'm, I start, I wrote about how he was so much a product of his time and we thought he was doing the right thing. Um, and I have a few uh, trusted readers that I send my chapters out to. Um, and one of them sent me back a note saying, you're too easy on Gottlieb at the very end because everything you write in the book leads up to a conclusion, but you know, your conclusion, it's too gentle. I mean, just look back at what you've written. And I did. And then I thought, you know, really, I think I got to be a little bit taken in by him. Um, and I added a specific word in that last uh, page or two pages, and that was the word heinous to describe the depths of his uh, depravity. So, yeah, I guess there is that danger. And um, with Gottlieb being such a complex character, uh, that complexity alone uh, makes him interesting and perhaps makes us a little less willing and less able to uh, dismiss him as simply diabolical. On the other hand, you might argue the opposite, that that's the most diabolical person of all. The one who has this other side that's so gentle yeah. and loving. That's even more terrifying. Yeah, because people, you can kind of confuse people that way and keep going with it because no one would ever think that you're doing the things that you're actually doing. And I tell you, when you read his reports by his friends, what a sweetheart he was, his employment reports, he would always go around and know everybody's first name, their kids' names. He wants to talk about their birthdays. He was very attentive. I mean, everybody that knows him in his, either in his office life or during his retirement life testifies to what a sweetheart and a lovely guy he was. Um, but uh, just to finish, uh, mm -hmm. I did... Uh, find this insight from a woman who was the rabbi in the town where uh, Gottlieb retired to and lived for his last years. And uh, she said she tried to talk to him, but uh, there was a wall that would come down. There were certain things that uh, he wouldn't talk about. And she said something uh, that I thought was very provocative. She said, uh, we read some things about what he had done and uh, they seemed very hard to understand, given the person that we know. And maybe Gottlieb himself also found it very hard to understand when he looked back and saw what he had done. To end off, I wanted to ask you a question, which is a version of the baby Hitler question. If you could go back in time and kill baby Hitler, would you do it? I, I was wondering if you could go back to Sidney Gottlieb when he was 18 and you can only say something to him you couldn't do anything to him but you could say something to Sidney Gottlieb at 18 years old what would you say if given that opportunity I'd say Sidney be like a nice Jewish boy and look at your older brother your older brother is gone is on his way to getting his PhD he is going to be a brilliant scientist. He's going to go on to found research institutes. He's going to win awards. He's going to mentor thousands of young scientists over his career. Why don't you do what your older brother is going to do? 
Go into a field where you're not going to be compromised. Watch out and try to guard your moral principles. Don't let them slip away from you uh, or be pulled away from you by the narrative of the Cold War that you hear around you. Yeah, the, <laughs> it's funny. If, if uh, Depending on what point I was in my life, I, I have an older brother and, and some things were very competitive between us. So if someone told me be more like my older brother <laughs> in my early teenage years, I'd be like, fuck this person. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm going to do something different than my older brother. Everyone's always telling me to, to be like that. But maybe, you know, no one, no one, it's, it's an impossible question to answer. What, well, what would you Well, what you say? say suggests that if I had gone back in history, if I could have done it, yeah. and given the chance that you wanted to offer me, it wouldn't have worked because he would have said just what you said. Oh, well, yeah. if that's what Kinzer says that I should be yeah. like my brother, then the hell with it. I'm going to do yeah. the opposite. You can go work for some secret agency in New Langley, Virginia. Yeah, he's like, actually, you just gave me an idea. I'm going to dose my older brother and make him the first MK Ultra experimentee. So thank you uh, <laughs> for your words. <laughs> All right. Well, thank, thank you. Yeah. Um, it's a fascinating story. I'm still getting over it myself. So uh, watch yeah, what again, somebody put uh, The book is uh, Poisoner in Chief by Stephen Kinzer, Sidney Gottlieb, and the CIA Search for Mind Control. Poisoner in Chief, Sidney Gottlieb, and the CIA Search for Mind Control. Is, is there a best place to follow you where you're posting articles, uh, latest books, things like that? Yeah, I have a, a my own web page. I write a newspaper column every couple of weeks, and I also write various commentaries. So I put all everything I write, among, along with other stuff, uh, including stuff about my books, on my web page. That's Stephen Kinzer, Stephen with a P-H, and it's K-I-N-Z-E-R dot com. And that's where you can find whatever it is that I'm doing and listen to my rants. But this one really went well. Thank you. Perfect. I'm, I'm going to link everything in the podcast description as well. For those of you listening, definitely go check out the book. There's, there's many more details that we, you know, we, we haven't and couldn't have even scratched in this one hour podcast conversation. So definitely go check it out. And, and thank you, Stephen, for your time. I appreciate it. 